Michael, how you doing? Yeah. What was that? The Charlie. His former car. car. Yes. Yeah. I don't believe this is here. Yes. Yeah. I don't believe this is here. Yes. Yeah. Hi, we're going to, and it may have been, you know, Andrea, so I don't know. Yeah, so I reached, yeah, I haven't heard back from her. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And Matthew, Jim, Catherine, Chris, Sharon, and Bard, welcome. Welcome. We have a quorum at this point, Charlie? Yeah, I think that put, that put us over quorum. Yep. Thank you all. Welcome. Welcome. This conference will now be recorded. We have a quorum at this point, Charlie. Yeah, I think that put, that put us over quorum. Yep. Thank you all. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. This conference will now be recorded. We have a quorum at this point, Charlie. Yeah, I think that put, that put us over quorum. Yep. Thank you all. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. This conference Welcome will now started. be recorded. We have a quorum at this point, Charlie. Yeah, I think that put, that put us over quorum. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. This conference Welcome will now started. be recorded. We have a quorum at this point. The Anything. So we'll move to the consent agenda. There is no consent agenda. So we'll move on to approval of minutes of May 20th, 2020 meeting. Corrections. I'll go ahead and second it, Amy. Let Garrett do the move. 2020 meeting. Thank you, Jeff. Any corrections. Corrections in the minutes. I think you need. I think we. Need I'll go ahead and second it, Amy. Let Garrett do the yes, and Garrett 2020 meeting. Thank you, Jeff. Correction. Correction. Okay. I'm Move to the correction. Corrections in the minutes. I think you need. I think we. I'll go ahead and second it, Amy. Let Garrett do the yes, 2020 meeting. Thank you, Jeff. Correction. Correction. Okay. I'm going to move to the correction. Correction. You have to well, say that Amy, Amy, it's Amy is a stickler for details, and I didn't want to let her down. <laughs> okay. Hearing no other comments, I'll ask those in favor of the motion. Please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone wish to abstain? Okay, next item is warm public hearing for the FY21 to 24 transportation improvement program. And so I'm going to uh, turn the screen over to Christine. Uh, Christine you And give me one second to. Oh, I lost her. Wait, you lost me? No, you're back. Here you are. You have the screen, Christine. 
Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Do we need to open the public hearing? It's not a public hearing yet. All right. Um, okay. So can we see that? Can you see this? Okay, so we're going to be talking about the um, 2021 to 2024 transportation improvement program. Um, where's the meeting now? And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what it is. And um, okay, so we're going to be talking and, about and the um, 2021 to 2024 transportation improvement July. program. Um, so, um, first of all, what it is, um, we're pretty and I'm just going to talk a little bit about what it is. The refresher, the tip is a list of projects that we expect. Twenty-four transportation improvement July. program. Um, so, um, first of all, what it is. Um, every year and um, it authorizes the funds to be spent on um, Chittenden County projects. It is based on a continuing comprehensive transportation planning process. It has to involve the state, the MPO, um, CCRPC is the MPO for Chittenden County, and the transit operators and the federal government wants us all to work together on this and um, decide what's best for the county as a cooperative group. Um, so the projects on the tip have to be ready to spend the money. They have county to have completed. And the transit the operators and the federal and government and wants us all to uh, work together on this is that and um, that decide have what's best to for have the county as a cooperative ago. group. But, um, um, so the project can't spend the money, then we're kind of wasting the space on the tip. And the projects also have to be listed in the trans transportation and capital program. The capital program is what authorizes VTRANS to work on projects. So for Chittenden County projects, they have to be in both the capital program and on the TIP in order to spend federal money in Chittenden County. Um, so the TIP is made up of three sections. There's an introduction um, that has an adoption resolution that explains what the TIP is. There's a glossary of acronyms. There is a map. Um, and this map is, these projects are on the ECOS online map. So that's the easiest way to look at them if you know how to find that map or you can ask me if you wanna find it. Um, and then section two is the, the actual project list. And then there's a section three that has some summary tables and figures um, just so that we can kind of total things and know what's in it. So just a little bit, this is a page, this is actually the, the TAC draft, but same um, projects as what we have in this draft. Um, all the projects are organized by community in alphabetical order. Um, we have the project name. Each project has two numbers, a little redundant, but um, we have a VTRANS number and then we have a CCRPC number. So if you were talking to VTRANS about the project, you would want to use their number. Um, and then what we're really looking at is the, the dollar amounts that are in these four years. This is in federal funds. Um, and this is the amount that we expect the project to spend. And then this is lists the phases. So they're, they're either in PE or preliminary engineering, right of way or construction. Um, then there's, excuse me, for some of the projects, <clears throat> there's a comment in, in the center area, the most common comment says funds to be obligated in FY20. And what that means is that the project is supposed to be finished this year. FY20 goes through September 30th, 2020. Um, so that's the, the, the most common comment. There's a few other different comments. So this one just means this project is finished or nearly finished and is going to be removed. Um, and then these two columns, federal funds obligated through FY19 and FY20 federal funds, essentially if you add these two together, you're gonna have the money that has been spent on the project or will be spent through September 30th of 2020. 
So this is the past spending on the project, basically. Um, total cost, this is in um, the federal, state, plus local funds. Um, project use category, there are 10 use categories, and we just do this so that we can kind of summarize projects in different ways. Um, funding sources, this is more for our partners, um, FHWA and FTA, and percent federal, state, local. And then there's a comment section that has um, comments, whatever else we want to say about the project. And then the um, VTrans project manager is listed as well. All right, so this tip is quite large, a total of 248 million. Um, this is the breakdown year to year, 54.9 in 21, 66.4 in 22, 84.4 in 23 and uh, 42.4 in 24. Um, and just to give you an idea of how that compares with other years, this table shows, this chart shows the funding for the past 10 years. And I think what you see from this is that, um, is how much variation there is year to year. And I think that's really because the tip follows projects readiness to go. Um, for sure, these four years are high. I think the high, the 2023 year, um, we have a lot of, we have some um, paving projects in that year. The exit 17 bridge is set to be reconstructed, Champlain Parkway. So there's a number of large projects in that year. Um, BIA. Excuse me? BIA, I'm not familiar oh, with that. Oh, Burlington actually. International Airport, sorry. That should say BTV, I guess. We used to say BIA. Is that is that good? Yeah, that's fine. I just had, I had never heard BIA before, so. Yeah, um, I will change that. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna sort of do the snapshot of the project. So aviation, these are the BTV, not BIA projects. Um, and these, it's important to note, are here for information. Um, we don't control these funds, but 26.2 million in the four years for a variety of different activities at the airport. Um, the new sidewalks and paths section, 12 projects here, totaling 5 million. These are grant projects. These are projects, these are bike ped grants or transportation alternative grants. So these are awards from VTrans. And um, I think if you you would note, if you looked at the year by year chart, that uh, most of these are in the first two years of the TIP, not much going out, and that follows the grant cycle. Um, and uh, so bridge preservation, we have 10 projects on this list, a combination of state highway, interstate, um, town highway bridges, um, exit 17 bridge is being reconstructed. Uh, which is not on this list. I think that showed up under roadway, but we have the Route 2 bridge in Richmond um, is being reconstructed and several other projects. Um, intermodal is Wilson Park and Ride, one project, 4.5 million. Um, this new facility, major roadway upgrade category. Um, there are four projects on the list, but it does make up a considerable amount of the tip, about 24%. Champlain Parkway is set to start construction, um, I believe, this year, really starting next year. Um, the exit 17 in Colchester, Crescent Connector and exit 12. Um, and then there's seven paving projects. So there's quite a bit of paving on this tip, some paving in Burlington, interstate paving. And then roadway corridor. rail grade crossings, intersection, um, signal work um, is mainly what makes this up. And transit, uh, 55 million. This is formula funds from FTA. There's some CMAC congestion mitigation, air quality funds, um, FTA grants, and also elderly and disabled programs. And the last category that I'm gonna mention is the stormwater environmental. And these are also grant projects. 
uh, municipal highway and stormwater mitigation grants and transportation alternative grants, 2.3 million on that. Does anybody have questions about any of the projects that I just went through very quickly? Um, so this, this bar chart shows the breakdown by categories. And as we discussed, um, the new facility major roadway upgrade is the largest um, of the categories at 24%. The transit follows at 20% and kind of down from there. Um, just to give you context on that, um, I put together this chart that shows the obligations by um, over the 10-year period of 2010 to 2019. So you can see that even though we have a very large amount in the current tip for that new facilities, major roadway upgrades, it's quite a small number over time of that, that we've spent on that project. So that's not a trend, it's just um, a function of the current projects. Um, and the last thing that I'm gonna talk about bullets on that list of projects that have been completed or will be completed this year. Um, that's the Blakely Road Liquor Lane, 2A, Vermont 289 in Essex, Vermont 15, um, Post Office Square to Five Corners. That was a streetscape project, some signal upgrades. The 2A James Brown Drive is being worked on right now and some, some sidewalks in Williston. The phase one, there's two more phase ones that are programmed for construction. Um, in this tip, exit 16 and then Crescent Connector. And phase two, project some signal up. Um, these four phase twos are programmed and then the remaining, there's a remaining five more phase three projects that are programmed for construction in this tip. Um, there are, this is the list of Okay, thanks. Next we have the meeting schedule for FY21. Charlie? Yeah, the, uh, there's a memo calendar in your packet uh, presented to you for approval. Uh, I don't know, 
if there are any edits, this is a good time to make them, but otherwise uh, we can make them during the course of the year. Move to approve. Anyone schedule? have any comments or, or edits to make? Mike? Um, yeah. it's, it's a question for the staff, uh, maybe Charlie. Yep. Um, this is Jeff. We're not really having an annual meeting this year because of the COVID-19 types of things. Um, it's usually a meeting where we interact with stakeholders and people that are important to us and those kinds of things. I was wondering if maybe if the executive committee couldn't work with the staff to try to figure out, hopefully once we get past this pandemic, that it may be possible for us to assemble budget course, you know, notwithstanding, to have a situation where we could meet with our stakeholders and meet with our constituencies and members of our municipalities um, to try to at least have some interaction and maybe we, maybe who knows, maybe we won't even be able to have a legislative breakfast, you know, this year, but I, I would hope that we as an organization would keep that in mind because interacting with our stakeholders and our constituencies is, uh, I think, absolutely vital to us. Yeah, so there was, um, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure what's happening with the PDF there, it went blank on me. Um, but um, we, we did have some conversation about maybe having that annual gathering in September, if we can. Um, we actually have a reservation and then uh, Jeff will see if that can happen. And if not, yeah, we'll come up with some yeah, ways to do it virtually uh, to have some increased engagement. Uh, agree that that's important. Um, and just uh, to be clear, um, the annual meeting is technically defined by the election of officers and the, the calendar vote. So this is technically our annual meeting, but it's not our, it's not our annual get together. Um, so we are, you know, I think for the purposes of our bylaws, this is our annual meeting, but you're right. We're not having the full, um, uh, you know, gathering of all of our partners that we would normally like to have at this time of year. Jeff, I would just note that um, Charlie is really good about meeting with all the different municipalities, um, meeting with all the select boards and um, throughout the year. So there is that ongoing connection. We, we, we do that anyway. I'm talking about commission members and, and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, I just, you know, I, it's usually a very valuable thing for us to do, and I realize we can't do it, but I hope we wouldn't give up easily on it uh, during this year, our budget, of course, allowing us to do that. Thanks, Jeff. Any other, any other comments before we move on? Okay, next agenda item, uh, Charlie, if I I'm recall, sorry. it's yours. I'm who uh, who um, made the motion and seconded the approval of the calendar? This is Andy, I made the motion. I seconded it, Barbara. Thank you. And I don't think we voted. Did we vote on it? I thought we voted on it, maybe not. I don't think we did. Okay. Thank you for keeping track of me. So if there's no other comments, I'd ask all those in favor of the motion uh, to adopt the calendar to please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone wish to abstain? Okay. That passes. Uh, Next item, Charlie, I think it's yours, the, the I-89 uh, quarter study update. Yeah, let me, um, uh, Eleni is gonna speak to that, I think. Um, yep. If I can, uh, can you share? I need to share my screen. I would love to do that, Eleni, because I seem to be having some technical difficulties. Uh -oh. Hold on a sec. I know, I've never had a PDF go blank on me before. 
Mm -hmm. All right, Elena, you should have control now. Yep. Let's see if I can share something. Uh, hmm. That's There's a people. It's a really nice picture. I just am looking for my PowerPoint versus a picture. <laughs> the photo's uh, great though. Ah, yay. Um, I'm going to stop sharing it and do it again because I can't see my presentation. And I have this problem with go meeting all go to meeting all the time. Don't know why. All right. Um, let's see. That is not the one. And Elaine is messing with that. I want to draw everybody's attention to the fact that the CDC yesterday is encouraging single occupancy vehicles, which of course Again. is the direct opposite of um, everything we have tried to accomplish for years, if not decades now. So hopefully this will all ease with the pandemic, but I wanted everybody to be aware that the CDC is now completely short circuiting any of those efforts we have, at least in the short run. Can you see my screen now? Yep. We yeah. can, but it's the presenter view. So you want to go to that display settings. Yeah. And I think it's the duplicate. Yeah. Did, there we go. did you change yeah. it? Okay. Yep. Very nice. Okay. Well, um, Hi all, I'm just gonna uh, start with uh, apologies to all the people that have seen this presentation before because we presented it to some select boards and some of our committees. Uh, so, but um, I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time with the uh, project overview and tell you where we are with the I-89-2050 study. I'm gonna uh, do a little bit of a summary on the, uh, I need to move this out of the way. Uh, summary of the first round of public engagement. We actually finished our uh, first round of public engagement just before we uh, everything closed down for the pandemic. So I'll talk a little bit more uh, about the comments that we received uh, during those three public meetings, as well as other comments we received. Um, I'll touch upon the, the draft vision goals and objectives. And you have seen this before, but we updated based on comments that we received from many, many different um, kind of uh, entities and stakeholders. And um, just uh, focus a little bit more about the interchange screening evaluation. And this is the first round. We're gonna be doing two rounds and I'll explain that in a little bit. And I'll, I'll just uh, finish up the presentation with next steps. I just want to uh, ask you first, please stop me if there is something that you uh, have a question about or, um, and now I can seem to be moving it. Eleni, when you moved the actual go to meeting people out of the way, you're just not on the presentation. So if you put your mouse back on the presentation, then you should be able to advance. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, just to remind everybody that the uh, the ID nine study basically uh, it just looks at the entirety of ID nine in Chinon County, all thirty seven miles of it, plus the seven interchanges that we have in the county, as well as the arterials that is immediately adjacent to the interchanges. And uh, in the upper uh, right side of this slide, you can see the inserts that shows the extent of the study area around each interchange, as well as if you really focus on it, you're gonna see the, uh, the actual inter intersections that we're gonna be evaluating. And these are mostly signalized intersections. Um, where we are in the in the uh, in the study, we are now finishing up task three, which is the the vision and goals, and um, uh, we're going to be asking the advisory committee to um, approve the the vision and goals and finalize it at their next meeting on June 30th. 
and, and hopefully uh, they will do that uh, so we can just uh, put that to, um, so that, that task is done. We are also in the midst of task four, the interchange evaluation. Uh, we finished the uh, first round and I'll talk about it in a second and we're embarking on the second round uh, this summer and fall. And I'll, I'll touch upon the next steps um, in a, a separate slide. So just briefly a summary of the public engagement and the public comments. As I said, we had three public meetings. Uh, we started in South Burlington in January. We went to uh, Williston in February and Winooski in March, uh, March 11. Um, and we also got a lot of comments on our website, the Envision ID9 website. We had a, a survey, a lot of people took that survey, but they also just left some comments for us. And this, this table in, in the right here uh, on the slide, there is a summary of the, all the comments we received and the public input that we received that it's on the website. Uh, if you wanna just um, uh, go in and basically look at it. Um, if you're also interested in the specific comments that we have, we have a spreadsheet that has all the comments and I'm happy to share it if you want to. So the, the table here at the, uh, at the lower left, uh, basically we try to uh, group the comments within categories. And you know, the first kind of categories, as you can see, it's more like the, the non-vehicular, uh, it, it's, it's, it's based on bike and pet, as well as public transit and, and the livability. And you can see the number of comments as well as the percent that represent. And the second one is the interchange upgrades. You can see that there was a lot of support uh, for some of interchange upgrades, um, mainly 12B, but there are some other ones too. Um, I'll show you in a second. And then at the widen ID9 had like a kind of a mixed support, like 5% said yes, 4% said no, uh, but uh, we're still kind of like, you know, we haven't really evaluated that yet. Um, so this slide, actually the table in the bottom there, it's a, it breaks down those categories a little bit more. So you can see here that actually, uh, you know, increased investment in public transit got uh, the, uh, the highest number of comments, 38. But then, you know, the, and, and they followed by the bike and pet infrastructure uh, improvements. But then, you know, the exit 12B was the same number of comments and going on to a lot of other issues, anywhere from, uh, we talked about exit 14 improvements to um, you know, noise walls, to HOV lanes, to a lot of other stuff. So we have all these things uh, broken down and, and we took that and we review all these comments uh, and we are um, you know, taking that into account as we move forward with the study. So the draft vision and goals, you have seen this um, before. Uh, it, it has been updated based on comments received from the technical committee, the advisory committee, from the public, um, and for, from other stakeholders. And um, what we're looking is really um, for our 89 corridor in Chinon County to be a system that is safe and resilient as well as reliable. Uh, and to actually accommodate the efficient movement of people and goods, and also to support our plans, our plans and our goals, whether those are state, regional, or, or local. So that's a kind of an overarching, you know, like statement about what we want to do. And then what we do, as you all know, we develop goals, and up each, under each goal, we develop objectives that is going to help us actually measure, um, you know, the, the uh, alternatives that we develop, and the strategies that we, you know, we develop, we can actually use these objectives and develop metrics that is gonna help us see if we can actually uh, meet the goals that we set up for the project. Um, so, uh, the, um, and this is not ranked in any way, but safety is a very important goal. We wanna enhance safety along the corridor as well as at the interchanges and along the corridor is mainly reduce the frequency and the severity of the crashes. And there is a lot of crashes on the interstate. And I believe that we shared that uh, the crash data with you at the previous presentation. We also are um, uh, looking to enhance the safety of bicycles and pedestrians at interchanges. And we know that is really challenging uh, for these vulnerable users and also improve incident response times. Um, 
We also are looking to basically uh, promote uh, livable, sustainable, and healthy communities by investing in transportation infrastructure that encourages growth in the, uh, in the areas plan for growth. That's where we want the growth to go uh, and is consistent with our plans and our goals, but also to ensure, and this is very important, uh, is to ensure that any improvements that we develop do not disproportionately affect and impact uh, you know, um, low income and minority populations. And that's something I'm going to be spending some time on. Um, as far as mobility and efficiency, there are, um, you know, issues right now in the urban core between exits 12 and 16, mainly between exit 14 and 15 on, on uh, delays and, and capacity issues. Uh, and so we want to look into the future and try to accommodate the anticipated, uh, you know, traffic demand. Um, and we want to just basically again maintain some you know reliable travel times. Uh, you know we can have this a huge variation in travel times, especially for freight, but even for commuters, uh, they they need to know that it's going to take the next amount of time that they can just leave their home and just go to their work, and that's an, an important part of it. Uh, improved network connectivity uh, in within the interchanges. Uh, as well as increase uh, the future public tra uh, transportation access as well as service. Uh, on the environmental stewardship, we want to just basically establish a resilient corridor, and you see all the objectives under that that we're going to try to accomplish with the improvements that we're going to be developing. We're going to be looking to support anticipate economic growth in the region as well as accommodate freight and goods movement, and that's. Uh, Kind of um, uh, it goes back to the mobility uh, goal and the the travel time reliability. Um, some of these objectives uh, they do have an overlap, uh, but I think it is important to point out uh, under each goal and the system preservation. That's a very important goal, very um, uh, very dear to Vitran's heart, but also to us. You know, we want to preserve our corridor. We want to preserve our interstate in a state of good repair, and, and that uh, will take. Uh, uh, money and, uh, and uh, away from other improvements, but that is a very important goal. Um, moving on to the interchange uh, evaluation. Take your questions, um, Eleni, or you want to save them for the end? No, 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 you can just ask. Um, Do you want me to go back? Yeah, no, no, in, in, in the goals, you'd mentioned incident response time. Mm -hmm. And a conversation I had with Joe Sigali some time back, he had mentioned at one point that um, there was some concern or some looking into, or I, I'm having a little trouble remembering the total gist of the conversation. When it comes to incidents, and I'm talking about crashes on the interstate, mm -hmm. that right now, um, continuing to try to move people through is an afterthought if, if no thought at all. In other words, the the economic impact of just stopping the interstate and having everybody sitting there for you know however long um, is just not a consideration at all. And I was wondering if in this, since we're we're studying these kinds of things, if studying some way that or, or putting some system together, the traffic when it's appropriate, because obviously safety is the most important thing, but when it's appropriate. The traffic can be kept moving rather than the response they do now, which is just close everything down, damn whatever's going on until we're done what we're doing, and then we'll reopen it back up, whether it can have kept traffic moving safely or not. So I was wondering yeah. if there's any thought into looking at that as part of this. Um, well, I think we're going to be looking at that, uh, John. I think also, uh, so we, we have talked to um, the emergency uh, you know, management personnel at the very beginning of the project, and they gave us all their you know, like, you know, input and, and, and concerns. And um, uh, we haven't really specifically talked about this, this issue, but as we move forward, and thanks for bringing it up, we're definitely going to look at it. The other thing that we might want to look at also is like if there is an incident maybe um, we basically try to just as much as possible just divert the traffic before they you know they get stuck in that part of the interstate that there is no exit um, that's an ITS uh, you know and uh, you know issues that we're going to be looking into okay. um, I, just know, but, I do believe this was at least on Joe's mind I don't want to speak for the agency I don't know how much beyond Joe it went it may have been an agency goal that he was referring to 
or it may have yeah, just been, and, but I, I know at least he has some interest in this particular subject. Yeah, and uh, no, that's good. Um, thank you for, for bringing it up. And Joe is sitting on our both the technical and our advisory committee. So I will, I'll make sure to just uh, talk to him about that. Anything else on the uh, draft uh, goals and objectives before I move on? Thank you. Sure. Um, so before I just just jump into the corridor screen, you know the um, uh, the interchange screening process. I just want to take a step back, at least a step up, and just uh, kind of look at the process that we're going to uh, be developing our final I eighty nine implementation plan because that's kind of an important point um, of how are we going to get through all of these steps to get us to the very end, which is our final implementation plan that we're going to bring it back to you uh, for approval, uh, comments and approval. So I'm just, uh, you've seen this slide in your packet, but uh, we added some uh, graphics that they, it might help, it might not, let me know uh, how it goes. Uh, so um, so we, we're breaking things down uh, into parts here. So uh, the first thing that we're doing is like we're going to looking at interchange recommendations. So the, we are breaking that down into a high level, uh, kind of evaluating a, a, like a number of alternatives. And at this point, we're evaluating eight uh, in the funnel. In, 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 and I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but in the, in the round one, you know, like right in the funnel, we have eight at the first round. And right now we have three, uh, a recommendation of three uh, interchanges to move into round two from the technical committee. That recommendation is going to go to the advisory committee at the end of June. And, and then uh, we're going to, the advisory committee will decide which interchanges or elements of interchanges are going to move into um, the next, um, you know, um, we're going to be in, well, so that's one thing. And before I move to the entire thing, it's like we're also going to be developing corridor recommendations. That's going to include like if that includes safety, IPS, bike and pet, um, edge of the lanes, uh, you know, additional uh, commuter transit. Uh, all of those stuff are much more like corridor recommendations as well as um, uh, capacity improvements on the actual interstate. Then uh, once we identify those and we have both the corridor recommendations and the interchange recommendations, then we move on to what we call we evaluate bundles of alternatives. So we just mix and match from the interchange as well as the corridors. We develop three bundles and then we evaluate that and see which one uh, provides uh, you know, the best benefits and it meets our um, you know, the goals and objectives. Um, and then, um, and that's kind of an important uh, kind of a concept here. Um, we're going to uh, establish what we call implementation triggers, especially for roadway capacity projects, uh, because uh, there are a lot of um, uncertainties at this point uh, with what's going to happen on our transportation system and our traffic. Uh, we don't know uh, the changes from the pandemic. We don't also know the, the possible changes from some um, technology improvements and uh, autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles. So what we're going to be developing is more like uh, thresholds. And when we reach that threshold, we're going to be like, you know, an improvement is going to get uh, triggered. Uh, and so we're going to try and do that. So basically, we only move to implement something when it's needed and one we not when we basically arbitrarily set a year for it. I'm going to stop right there if there are any questions on that. Okay. Yes, yeah, so Elaine, this is Jim. I have yeah. a question for you. Yep. Um, talk about creating the three bundles. Mm -hmm. When you reviewed all those bundles, are you going to, um, in essence, pick one or might you actually create a fourth one that sort of blends a few of them. It's probably going to be a fourth one, Jim. Uh, that okay. blends everything. Good. That, I'm. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad you're not going to just stick to one or the other, and that's it. No, no. Thank it's you. like you know. I think that the at the very end, the implementation plan. It. I. I. I'm fairly certain that it's going to be a blend of uh, some elements of each of these bundles. Thank you. Sure. 
So, uh, and then once we establish this, we move into the final, um, um, you know, plan recommendations. Uh, it's going to come uh, at the end of 2021. So back to the interchange screening evaluation. Uh, as I said, we had eight evalu uh, uh, interchanges that we evaluated at this first uh, round, uh, starting from the South uh, Bolton 10A. We have a number of them in South Burlington, as you can see. Uh, and we have we evaluated also a full interchange in Winooski and also um, 17N in Milton, which is actually a, 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 an exit north of exit 17 uh, at the, um, I think it's West Milton Road. Um, I'm not going to go through this in a great detail, just to orient you on these evaluation metrics. You have this in your packet. I'd be very happy to talk to anybody that wants to just focus on numbers and on, on, on spreadsheets, I would love that. Uh, but just to just uh, give you a little bit of a kind of orientation, again, you know, on the left side of the, of the, uh, of the table, you, can, you see the metrics, uh, the description of the metric, as well as the units. Um, the metrics were organized by goals. You can see that we have all the goals here, except the, uh, the preservation of the system and the maintenance. And that is a goal that we're going to be looking into when we move into this, uh, to the corridor, uh, you know, um, improvements. Uh, uh, moving on to the colorful kind of side of the of the table, then you have like the, the interchanges, uh, you know, the eight different interchanges on on the columns, starting from 10A uh, in Bolton, going all the way to 17N in Milton. Um, and this is uh, kind of a very important point that we wanted to um, just kind of like uh, pull it out so it's very transparent, is that um, the committees, uh, the, the technical committee uh, uh, and the project team uh, basically uh, agreed to, uh, you know, apply double weights for two measures. And those two measures are, um, you know, right here, it's the consistency with the original plan. It's, it's after the little purple, the it's orange actually, uh, you know, like row there. So it's consistency with the original plan as well as the impacts to the exit 14 uh, traffic. And we did that because as you all remember, the genesis of this study and the impetus of starting this study was when we did our MTP and we found out that we had major capacity issues between exit 14 and 15, as well as around the exit 14 area. And that was, we wanted to just check that out because having uh, like a V over C ratio over one on our interstate is, uh, is very troubling. So we wanted to investigate that a little bit more. So we apply, um, you know, so we put the emphasis on, uh, on the mobility goal in the urban core of the, uh, of the county. Um, again, I am not going to go through these. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And I'm just going to uh, bring you to basically the, the total score and the results, which, um, you know, if you go to, you can see that basically exit uh, 13, uh, the hybrid, which is basically elements of the 13 pool, which is an, um, it's a design that was developed decades ago. But uh, some of the elements are really strong and some of them not as much. And we took some elements of that and we took the exit 13 U-turn and we created this hybrid. And I'm happy to show you like a, uh, a diagram in a second. And then 12B, they scored the highest and they exhibited the best regional benefits in the urban core of the county. Um, we had uh, uh, some people that basically uh, asked about the 10A and the 17N. There are some advocates for those two, um, you know, interchanges. Uh, what our uh, evaluation indicated that they, those two interchanges have localized transportation benefits, and but they are uh, mostly an economic, and you know, vehicle for those areas. So it's an economic development vehicle for those areas. And uh, if uh, there is a constituency and the municipalities want to uh, evaluate these interchanges further, that's going to be done in a separate process. Uh, they are not moving into the second round of the, um, at least the technical committee did not move them in the second round of the uh, uh, 
um, of the evaluation of the interchanges. So you can see at the at the very end of this slide that the technical committee met um, mid May, and they decided to move exits 12B, 13, and 14 further for further evaluation. Uh, again, the uh, um, the the advisory committee will meet January 30th, and they're going to have the you know the saying in uh, what moves forward to the second round of evaluation. I want to just quickly mention that um, in the second round of evaluation, now we have a little less uh, you know a more manageable number of interchanges to deal with. We also going to be um, developing additional metrics under each goal, and we also going to be focusing on uh, well, uh, the secondary growth metric for land use. Um, so we're going to be developing uh, in, in July, we're going to bring together a panel of experts called Delphi panel, uh, and they're going to just provide us guidance and direction of uh, anticipated growth as well as where this growth is going to go if we add a new interchange or if we improve an interchange, let's say 13 uh, or even 14. So, and then we're going to use the original model to run the different land use scenarios, and so we can see the impacts of uh, these uh, major uh, inter interchange improvements. So that's going to be happening in the second round. I just want to make sure that you knew that. And so I'm just going to finish up here with the next steps. Advisory committee, I said it many times, uh, June 30th, they're going to finalize the goals. They're going to tell us uh, which interchanges are going to advance to the second round. And then we're going to be doing uh, a lot of work on the second round of interchange screening in the summer and fall. We're going to be developing uh, the entire quarter recommendations in the kind of like winter, spring uh, time, uh, time frame. And then hopefully we're going to bring everything together uh, and have a final report by the end of uh, 2021. At least that is my hope. And I think that is uh, my presentation for that. I'm happy to take any questions. If you want to see any of the interchanges, uh, you have them in your packet. So we have the interchange maps. Um, just going to quickly take you to just the hybrid of 13, uh, which is basically incorporates the U-turn as well as some of the elements of the, you know, of the uh, previous design of uh, book 13. Any questions? Delaney, this is Jeff. Um, yes. In the original uh, projections that were used to develop the congestion estimates, I'm assuming mm -hmm. those were done before the pandemic. Those were done from, I'm sorry, Jeff, I didn't prior catch the last one. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, yes. Do we have an alternative in case this pandemic changes the way that people commute? Yeah. Because people are discovering now that, hey, I can work from home and right, I don't have right, to go right. sit in traffic. Right. And I just was like wondering if you yeah. thought we were, I was wondering if you felt we were covered with our evaluation of alternatives with what we might see come out of here in terms of a long term structural shift in traffic patterns due to COVID-19? Right. Uh, that's that's a, a great question. And I think that the way around it, I mean, for us to actually update our models, it's going to take years of gathering data and, and changing things in our, our regional uh, model as well as our... So the way we're going to address that and to go around it is like, um, it's this triggering that I talked about. Like, you know, so uh, I talked about uh, you know, basically identifying these thresholds uh, of, and it can be anything, it can be V over C, it can be volumes, it can be, uh, we're going to come up with uh, some thresholds on some measures that when, so it, so we won't actually uh, move forward with an improvement or a strategy unless we reach that threshold. So there's going to be a, lo a lot of monitoring of our system after we finish this study, Jeff, and I think it's going to be, it's going to be necessary to figure out because nobody knows the impacts of COVID or, um, I don't know, technology uh, moving much faster than it has been on uh, autonomous vehicles. So we are developing this, uh, uh, you know, improvements and alternatives using these tools pro, pre, 
pre-pandemic, uh, but we realize and we understand that things will change. And, you know, and we don't know what the impacts are going to be on transit, right? We don't know what the impacts. Uh, so we need to be monitoring these conditions. So we need to be uh, nimble enough to say we reach the threshold. We're going to move into that improvement, at least um, planning and, and designing of that improvement. Did I answer your question? Yeah, we just, I'm just, I'm just nervous that there would be a uh, there could be an attack on the study. Yeah, uh, you know that goes to the basic essentials of our traffic forecasts and our congestion forecasts and even the need for some things yes. that could be brought about by this. You know, this is a black swan event. Mm -hmm. And even though at some point in time we'll have a therapy or a, or probably a vaccine that takes care of the public health aspects of it, there I'm just concerned that we're doing a study out to 2050. And this is one of those things, you know, like autonomous vehicles or something like that, that could actually hit us long before that. And we're going to be making investments that are going to be in place for half a century. And we could be rightfully criticized for not taking that more fully into account. And I just, I don't yeah. want to put on our, us or ourself or even our plan at risk for that without offering some fully considered opinion. And I think the monitoring is a great approach um, and you know to recognize that, but somebody I think could rightfully say, well, the traffic projections and the model settings that went about determining these congestion points don't include something that we know is already happening and it could be a major thing. Um, although, you know, the offsetting thing is single occupancy vehicles again, you know, I mean, um, so I just, I, I just think we have to be very careful about that and we have to be right up front and, uh, and, and fully disclose it and tell people that this is a continuous planning process and we're just right now developing the starting point and it'll evolve yeah. over time and we're not going to invest money where we don't need to invest. Absolutely. I, th I think you're absolutely right, and we need to be transparent and upfront about, yeah, uh, uh, post-pandemic, uh, things might be different, and we're not going to spend the money if we don't need to spend them, for sure. So, uh, yeah, all good points, Jeff, and we're going to try and to be uh, pretty clear about this as we move forward. Any other uh, comments, questions? Okay. Yeah, Thank this, you. This is Daniel. Uh, I'd love to echo. Um, I, um, there it is. Are you? I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? This is Daniel. An observation. Um, yeah, Don, you're uh, really garbled. Can you maybe do the, can you uh, tell us your question in the chat? I don't know if you heard me, but if you can, uh, if you can type the question into the chat okay, room, then well, rather than there. Can't do much better than um, closer to my. Or maybe turn computer. off your video. That sometimes yes. works too. Can you hear me now? Um. You want to try again? Video off. Hmm. Is he is he typing? I can't see the chat for some reason. Let's see. I don't see anything in the chat yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm sending a note um, oh. via chat. Hopefully, Don picks it up and and can send his question in there. <laughs> okay. In the All meantime, right. any other question, comment? Thing we ought to be thinking about. And um, if I guess I wanted to throw out there a couple things. Um, you know, we, this is obviously, you know, 
a pretty big effort. Um, we're trying to get to uh, the different select boards and any other body that you know, is interested in this. Um, so if you talk to anybody that wants to engage in this, please just let us know. We're happy to come, well, or send them a link and we'll have a conversation. Um, so, uh, and, and also we know uh, that we'll definitely need to do some more engagement for uh, you know our minority and low income residents and try to uh, make sure we're doing as much as we can. Uh, it's also it's also not just the law, but uh, good practice. Um, and so we'll uh, be trying to make more efforts as we work on these bundling. Um, over the next few months, we'll, we need to do a lot more work there. And Charlie, as part of, John Zaccone here, as part of the outreach for this, you may want to consider in the future to have something a little closer to Montpelier. I realize we're the Chittenden County Transportation uh, MPO, but you know, a, a lot of those residents are using this stretch of highway coming here for work. Um, and it would just be good to have a, at least one place where we actively engage that community. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, we were, um, we did send out uh, offers uh, to meet with our neighboring regional planning commission. So we were actually at the, um, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission uh, sometime in that last time frame as well. Um, and in and, and Addison at their TAC, uh, Northwest uh, RPC deferred engagement, but you know, clearly the folks in St. Albans and, and that area um, and the islands you know, use the interstate as well. So uh, point taken, yeah, we, um, and if you hear anything <laughs> where they feel like we have it, please let us know, happy to do some extra engagement as, as needed. And Don, I, I guess uh, you weren't able to type your question either. Um, so, sorry, we weren't able to hear you, Don. Right, and um, if he, Don, if you wanna just send, send an email to me, I'm happy to either talk to you or respond to whatever question that you have, uh, happy to do it. I'm gonna um, try to um, take back the presentation and pull us back to the agenda if there's no more questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our executive director uh, report, Charlie. Yeah. Um, so uh, legislative update, I think I'll just uh, try to turn this over to uh, Regina. Uh, the, the biggest thing that uh, relates to some of the things that, that we work on seems to be S-237 at the moment, um, which uh, has been, I think, uh, the informal name has been the housing bill. Um, started off in Senate Economic Development with Senator Sorokin. And uh, it's moving through the Senate now, uh, maybe even getting voted out of the Senate tomorrow. Uh, but it has not yet been considered at the House. And so um, I think we want to go have a little bit deeper conversation. There are a couple pieces of this that may seem familiar, because when we talked about Act 250, there were a couple pieces that, that may be getting picked up from that Act 250 discussion and pulled into this. Uh, but there's also some other more specific housing pieces. Um, and so give me a second, Regina, and I will turn this over to you. Except I lost Regina, where is she? I'm here. Oh. Ah, there you are, I see you. <laughs> right next to you in my picture. No, the, rest of, the rest of the list is alphabetical, except, you know, except for Regina. All right. <laughs> It's like Hollywood Squares. Okay, can folks see um, our proposed comments? Anybody? If you're giving me like a thumbs up, I can't see you. Yeah, it's yes. pretty yes. Yeah, I can see you fine. Yes. Okay, thanks. Question? <laughs> Uh, did, have we seen, was this part of the package or is this new? What you are seeing on the screen is a part of your packet. Hmm, I guess I missed it. Okay. 
Um, Thank you. It's probably towards the end, um, but it's definitely in there, and the uh, the bill is in there as well. As though, though I would warn that the bill is has been uh, amended by various committees and will be um, amended going forward. And so I don't necessarily want to focus folks too much on the actual bill because a lot of this is likely to continue to keep shifting. Um, but as Charlie said, S-237 was originally started specifically as the housing bill. It had a number of different funding um, pieces in there. Um, very originally, there was an intention of um, hoping to have another housing bond that's been out of this for a while. But um, there was also a little bit, for a little bit of time, there was a provision in here um, to fully fund BHCB, um, but the Senate Appropriations Committee pulled out all of the funding um, components of this. Um, what remains are some specific housing um, components that really would um, change how local municipalities zone for housing. Um, at the local level. So um, there are some changes to accessory dwelling units. The intention is um, to try to make accessory dwelling units um, easier to actually implement and build. Uh, there are some changes um, suggested where in areas where we have water and sewer that um, single family zoning would essentially go to duplexes. Um, there's a number of different items in here. And there's, the framework is a little bit confusing because there's almost two separate sections of the bill, the way that they're describing these um, zoning changes. Um, a few are in place kind of across the board. That's where the accessory dwelling unit changes live. And then in a separate framework, um, it basically acknowledges if you have municipal water and sewer, and if this development is able to connect to that municipal water and sewer, there's a, another slew of um, recommended changes to really try to um, get us to a place where we are addressing our um, housing shortage and really try to um, do some correcting of inequities that have um, been the result of um, zoning and our traditional way of using it. Um, so comment number two here on the screen um, is um, getting at some of the pieces of that section of the amendment that um, the PAC was comfortable with putting forward here to the board. Um, that essentially means that there is some consensus on the accessory dwelling unit changes. Um, I will add that the Vermont Planners Association are also okay with the accessory dwelling unit changes. Um, the duplex piece, we did get to consensus on that it, with the PACT, though the Vermont Planners Association has not come to consensus on that, just so, just so folks are aware. Um, there is this is really a very minor change. Um, there's a very specific provision in the enabling statute about um, allowing development on existing small size lots. Um, they're making a slight amendment to that that the PAC feels comfortable with. Then there's a slew of other changes that the PAC um, and staff is basically suggesting at this stage of the game um, a, it gets to a level of specificity. I guess I would point this out a little bit in terms of um, establishing minimum lot sizes. The concept is to try to um, increase density in these areas where we have water and sewer. Um, but just as, a, as an example, in Winooski's form base code, the whole concept of a lot size is almost completely removed from the framework. Um, the idea is that you can hit density targets without tying it to sort of this um, more traditional lot size concept. Um, so that's the reason why that there isn't necessarily agreement on that. Um, 
there's very specific provision about leasing of parking spaces, which is uh, um, just so specific, it's a little bit tricky to kind of implement. Um, and then there's a concept in there about multi-unit housing. Um, this actually is not um, tied to that kind of water sewer framework where a municipality could kind of opt out of it. Um, so there, there's a lot of very specific stuff in here. Um, it can change, it will change, it can change quite a bit. Um, I think what we're ultimately asking the board for um, is general, generally, um, if folks are comfortable with where these comments are, um, the bill, like Charlie said, is getting a lot of the Act 250 provisions sort of pulled into this. Um, and so we'll, Charlie will sort of need to be um, as nimble as possible as things continue to change. And so we'll look to the Act 250 provisions and comments that the board approved over the winter, um, likely as well as this document, if you folks are comfortable with it, um, in terms of how to be responsive at the legislative level going forward. Um, a number of these other things are not really very different than what we've said before. Um, one of the Act 250 conversations that is pulled into this bill is the concept that designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas would be exempt from Act 250. We have um, long been in favor in that, of that and would like to see that happen. Um, and then there's a bunch of this that just is sort of like the mechanics of how that would work and how those existing you know, Act 50 permits would be handled. Um, there is a provision in there where those of you who have municipal wastewater systems, um, the, this, this bill would allow you as a municipality to issue that connection permit to your wastewater system if it's a single use connection um, without also the applicant having to go to the state and get a wastewater permit. Um, this is one of those sort of streamlined provisions that we've been asking for for quite some time. So that would be great if that moves forward. It is pretty limited. It still means that an applicant would need to go to the state for a subdivision, but at least there's a little, little bit of movement on that. Um, and then some of this we've definitely talked about before. Um, there are other sections and provisions that were talked about extensively in the Act 250 conversations, namely um, trying to better protect forest blocks, limit habitat fragmentation in those um, areas of significant forest blocks and wildlife habitat. Um, it's still not well defined in the bill. Um, and so we're going to sort of keep coming back to the table that we need some better definitions and understanding of what exactly we're talking about if we're going to add something as broad as forest blocks into these bills. The current definition is still extremely broad. Um, one of the things that was talked about in the Act 250 conversation is some acknowledgement of deference for A&R permits. That hasn't been one of the things that is pulled into this S-237. Um, so we're just making that comment. Um, and then just generally in terms of trails, um, there is a section on trails in the current bill. Um, I haven't had a chance to really dig into it to see if it is um, exactly what we would support, but this statement regardless is what is what we're trying to say. Um, any Questions, comments? Um, uh, wherever my hand is, just Jim. I have a few. <clears throat> um, going back to, I found it. I was actually looking at the the summary and then the bill, and I didn't notice that the comments were actually before that in the package. So thanks for letting me know they were there. Um, in number five, comment number five, uh, for the housing, in, I, I think that this is good, but I think we may want to consider recommending a performance base, um, possibly, 
in this situation rather than actual tools um, or um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Yeah. Instead of an allowance for implementing uh, just those four tools, there's a lot more that could be used. And I think it's better to say, this is what we want to achieve. And we leave it up to the municipalities mm -hmm. to how to achieve that rather than saying, you've got to use one of these four tools, or maybe you might be able to get an allowance for not using some. So I think I'd like to have us at least think about that a little bit more for number five. Um, Great. The forest block issue. I know that in the past, and I think I've heard that it's in here still, was the 2,000 foot road provision. And yes. And I think that we have in the past have, have in our recommendations have expressed concern about using that blanketly. And I would yeah. like to try to bring that, if it's still in this bill or has been brought into this bill, I'd like to bring that into comment number seven as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So um, just in terms of process wise, uh, the bill has basically been amended sort of kind of quite a bit by Senate Natural Resources and then ton of, a lot of that sort of pulled back in terms of um, keeping what was originally in S-237. Um, but it looks like they're, they are still, as of today, keeping in a lot of that Act 250 stuff. The road mm -hmm. rule, as we um, refer to it, is, as of today, in. So that is a good point. We do have that comment on our original Act 250 list. Um, exactly. That's why I'd so like to bring can, it in. Yeah, so I can add it here. Um, but again, we Charlie will definitely be pulling from both of these two documents because this is just going to like be all over the place. But I'll definitely yeah. do that. Um, and then lastly, just a general point that uh, within VPA and here, at least in Chittenden County with us, um, a lot of the provisions that they are trying to put into this that communities and planners will need to implement, those actual people are not necessarily in support of that. So that's like a general comment that you're, you're, you're doing something that the, the audience and the regulators and whatever who need to enforce them don't think they're good ideas because of like that number four, you know, parts of number two um, and number, what is it, five? And you may, that might be just a general point that you can make, Charlie, as you're making the talk or as you're doing presentations, if it becomes relevant, that in theory, there was a lot of discussion with the planners in order to get this to it where it was, but in essence, there really wasn't because they didn't pay attention to a lot of the points made. So, that could be something you may want to use or might not want to use. <clears throat> Good point. Uh, and I think uh, that was it for me. Hi, this is Sharon. I just wanted to add that, um, and I think Regina, you did a great job summarizing a moving target. Uh, one of the things that some of us, at least in VPA, are concerned about, if all the bits and pieces of Act 250 get merged into the housing bill, that it'll basically undermine the attempt to really do Act 250 reform next session. So a lot of the studies and a lot of the other provisions related to Act 250 in the House bill um, obviously aren't getting forwarded through S-237. So I think at least on VPAs and we've asked that they um, not forget that there's other things that need to be addressed next session, uh, even if this goes forward. Great point. Hi, Regina, this is Jeff. Um, a general comment, um, I, I mean, a specific one first. I think we should have at least a few reservations about number four, okay, relating to section eight, particularly from the standpoint of, you know, a statewide review process would be incorporated into local development review. As a municipal member organization, when I first read that, it rubbed me a little bit the wrong way, but that's not my, that's not my real comment. My real comment here is that this bill is heavily supply expanding centric, okay? 
we as an organization are trying to get people to remember that there are people in the middle that with some demand side assistance can we can address some of their needs and we can make scarce dollars go a lot longer. I would add to that that when you expand supply, you're making a hundred year decision because if you build something, you're building it, it's there for a hundred years or more. With demand side approaches, they're geographically mobile and they can adapt to the changing and evolving needs that happen like after a pandemic, okay? So I know that the, 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 the metric that we have is that we wanna build more units, okay? We want to expand the supply of affordable units, but if we can also do that with some demand initiatives, we may be able to take units that currently aren't affordable and move them into the affordable category without having to go through the expense of building them. And we, in our own ECOS plan, talk about don't forget the middle, and this bill forgets the middle. That's my point. Well, it maybe doesn't forget it, but it emphasizes addressing things on the supply side when there may be more efficient and more flexible means to the demand side to help people without having to go through the process of constructing units and can get and address those needs sooner. And I know that people like to cut ribbons for things to get things done. And I know we like to talk about all the units that were built that are affordable in our own metrics. But if we're really talking about helping people, we can't ignore the demand side, unless for some reason, everybody thinks we're doing a bang up job on the demand side and we don't do need to do any more. As you can tell, this is my pet peeve about affordable housing. Yeah, and I, I get it, certainly. And, um, you know, this is like many things, even if we just look at zoning in and of itself as one specific tool on how to sort of address this full spectrum of issues. Um, I think the, the concept here is that we shouldn't unnecessarily have zoning be the, be the thing that is a stopgap on that supply side for sure, um, unnecessarily. And I think it's just one of many things that makes sense to put into place, but I definitely hear you. Um, and uh, Champlain Housing Trust has definitely been doing a lot of good work of kind of bringing existing structure into their programs and trying to address it from that end too, because um, I definitely hear you. It seems um, if just a, a complete build, build, build is the only solution. It's not likely for us to, it, we're not likely going to solve a problem with that in and of itself. Well, and we're making long-term decisions that we're, we may regret 25 years from now that we built buildings where we're building them because they no longer meet the need of the population and where they want to live and those kinds of things. And, and it, I just, it, it's the flavor of the last decade is to, do all the stuff that this bill is proposing that we're doing and do more increased density. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. It's the way to increase, use, use infrastructure more efficiently and all those kinds of good things. But um, I just notice an emphasis on supply expansion almost to the point where that we're taking the demand side for granted. And I don't think we should, and I think we should not miss at least the opportunity to make the point if we can. Yeah, you know, it's John. Um, Jeff, although I, I understand what you're saying, I never viewed this as a policy document that we must or should be doing these things as much as to it is changing the rules that uh, are on the road so that if we want to build those things, we don't have the impediments anymore. I view those as totally separate things. And I I never viewed this process and this bill as a, we must build as much as we must give people the tools to do the building if in fact they wish, because it's a good idea that these not be impediments. So I, 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 I while I understand your concern, I can't say I ever drew that connection. Well, then you know that once they do something like this, the next thing is to throw a whole bunch of money at it. 
maybe, um, but that, you know, that, be that as it may, I, I see this more as a remove impediment bill than an encourage development bill, but, um, you know, one can lead to another, certainly. Do pages of discussion on quarter acre and eighth acre lot sizes really remove impediments? I mean, I'm wondering, you know, how much further they're going to go with the level of detail that to me just gets insane in this. Yeah, I think that's there's a, a level of question about that. Um, I think it's there's a lot of logic to sort of setting a standard. Um, but the, I think that the challenge is there's so many other specific tools on how you can achieve that same result. And it really, to Jim's point, um, also, I think that was on number eight, but um, we could be more performance based where we're just trying to set some stand, set some goals and then let municipalities um, get there um, in more unique ways. So. Any other thoughts, comments? Yeah, and we had this on the agenda as a potential action item. Um, I guess I'd, Curious as to the level of comfort with some of those uh, the caveats and edits that were discussed. If there's comfort with generally these kinds of comments, um, married up with the comments that we already you know approved on Act 250, um, and and I'm really I'm you know just looking for a little bit of direction as this uh, moves from the Senate to the House. I'm not clear. If this is going to be in the house in the next two weeks or if this is going to be in the house in august but clearly leadership has given some sort of green light to this moving this session so charlie are you uh, looking for more of consensus from us as opposed to approval either one is whatever you're comfortable with i guess charlie. i want to ask go ahead jim uh were you do you I believe this is on the Senate floor at this point. Right. So these comments would be most likely going to the House. Exactly. Okay. All right. Personally, I'm comfortable with them given the discussion we've had tonight. Same here. Everyone else okay with the discussion? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, right. Thanks. I'll pull us back to the agenda here if I can. Thanks for thank you. Here. Yeah. Thank thanks you. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Thank you. And Regina, I think you have to make me presenter now. It's so confusing because I can't see anything except this document, but I'm working on it. Okay. So, Charlie, make you presenter. Yeah. There we go. Now I can finally see everybody. All right. Thank you, Regina. Um, so, um, yeah, the only other thing, just to um, give an update, uh, just in terms of our budget and operations. Um, so I'll, I'm going to keep this as just a monthly or every meeting update, um, just not knowing what might change month to month. Um, to date, we have had no real significant uh, in budget impact from all the COVID shutdowns and uh, you know state revenue reductions. Um, but that just means you know the legislature didn't make a lot of changes in FY20. We have yet to see what will happen for FY21. So uh, stay tuned. Next meeting, we'll have some sort of update. Um, the administration, on a positive note, did. Uh, proposed full funding for the regional planning grant program. Um, and we're not anticipating any changes that we've heard about in terms of the MPO funding. So um, those are our two biggest funding pots. So 
you know, fingers crossed at the moment, uh, but we'll keep you uh, posted. And then operations, um, we did just this week uh, start to reopen our office a little bit to those uh, few staff that uh, wanted to get in there. So um, we got a couple staff that are in there one day a week and uh, two or three staff that are in there maybe two days a week. Uh, with a lot of protocols, uh, all the CDC and Department of Health protocols uh, and VTRANS protocols for field staff um, in place. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the, the latest and uh, the staff seems to be uh, resilient and <laughs> kind of uh, dealing with the changes well. And um, I don't know if any, any staff members or, or board members have any comments or questions on any of that, but then if not, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Next we have committee and liaison activities and reports are in your packet. If there's any questions? That looks like future agenda items. Yeah, just, uh, we do have the hearing. Uh, next month um, and the uh, basin plan for the uh, basin five direct the lake uh, basin is up and we'll probably start a conversation to uh, look at our committee membership so just uh, heads up to start thinking about that and I don't know if there are any other items that we should talk about anyone have any items that they'd like to think about putting on the agendas in the future I move we adjourn. Uh, before we do that, let's go to members items. Oh. And uh, Chris Roy is here, and I just want to recognize the fact that this is Chris's last meeting. Um, he has resigned his position because of, of personal uh, and family things. Chris, um, we're trying to figure out how long you were on the board, Chris. We think it was somewhere around between 20 and 50 years, but we're not sure. Um, well, it probably felt like for like that for the rest of you, but it was only eight. Eight years, <laughs> okay. Uh, but thank you for your service to the board and uh, on the executive committee and your years of leadership as the chair of the board. Um, and good luck to you in the future. Hope you come back to see us. Um, Thank you very You're much, here. Mike. I'll, I'll make this very quick because I'm the last item on a lovely evening. Um, I do want to thank everybody. It's been a real privilege working with staff, current members, <laughs> former members of the commission. Uh, some of you heard the story back when I first got on the RPC that when I was a kid, um, my brother, who became a civil engineer, and I, we would get rolls of newsprint from the Times Argus, and we would roll them out in our basement and we used to draw cities with streets and infrastructure and neighborhoods and everything else. And you know, little did I know when I was doing that in the early 70s that someday I might end up being chair of the RPC. So you never know what you're training for when you're a kid with a crayon. So um, I appreciate it, uh, the opportunity to serve. I will keep watching you. As you know, I will, uh, till my dying breath, be monitoring progress on the uh, Circle Alternative Project. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we wish you all the best, and I'm sure you all look forward to the opportunity to get together again and meet in person because it really is the people that make the organization, and this is a great group of people. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate your time with us. You're here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Yes, thank you, Chris. Yeah. Good luck, Chris. Any other members' items or other business? So Chris should make the motion to adjourn. <laughs> Good point. That's why have I ever done that before? I don't know. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. To Move to adjourn. Mm. Second. Okay. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night, all. This conference is no longer being recorded. 